good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is Live with Faye. Remember, every day we have a discussion about things that are of national importance. And what's of national importance right now? Everybody's asking questions about the vaccines. Are the vaccines going to be safe? Will there be side effects? Should we take it? Will we have to pay for it? Uh, will we be given a choice of vaccines? Or is, are these all decisions that the government is going to make for us? Uh, we don't have the official answers to many of these questions because the government hasn't been very communicative about its plans. There's also a lot of gray area as far as the vaccine manufacturers are concerned. The Times of India this morning, for example, uh, carried a comment from an official at the Serum Institute that basically said the government still hasn't placed an order for the vaccines, even though the vaccines have been manufactured and there is a stockpile of vaccines ready. So, so much going on. And um, I couldn't think of a better person to ask all of these questions to than uh, Dr. Professor K. Srinath Reddy, President of the Public Health Foundation of India. Now, give me a minute and I'll tell you uh, a little bit about our guest. And it's really important that you know. Now, uh, Dr. Reddy used to be the head of the Department of Cardiology at the uh, Ames Hospital, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. But he gave that up to become a public health professional and an advocate because, and you can find his TED talk on the internet if you look for it, he talks about how he realized that it's not just fixing the heart, but we have several problems in our country that need to be looked at from a public health point of view in order to improve public health, especially for the poorest in our country, many of whom get bankrupted because they simply cannot afford healthcare, medication, implants, that sort of thing. He's also the adjunct professor of epidemiology at Harvard um, and a really good voice right now to talk about epidemiology considering we're in a pandemic. He was the president of the World Heart Federation between 2013 and 15. He's a Padma Bhushan awardee and advisors to the governments of Odisha, Punjab, Haryana and Andhra Pradesh on public health. He's also, I must point out to you, very generous with his time whenever we ask him for time and very patient with the questions that we ask him. So. Uh, if you have questions, leave them in the chat window and I will ask your questions as well. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us and thank you for giving us your time again. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> um, I know you're a very busy man and you have many people who need your advice. So we're going to get straight to the point. The first question, and I asked this on Twitter uh, less than an hour ago, I said, what is your biggest question to do with the COVID vaccines? We have nearly 400 questions on Twitter, but the most common question is very simply, is it safe? Will there be side effects? And will we see that data? Well, uh, as far as uh, the safety is concerned, we have to depend upon the data from the trials, the phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. And yes. look at each vaccine and whatever data that they have presented to the regulator, even if they have not published in the trials, uh, published the trials in scientific journals. So it appears that as far as safety is concerned, it's fairly well established that most of them are very, very safe. Some adverse effects have been reported, most of them minor, mm. for the vaccines, which have been basically initially flagged off like the mRNA vaccines, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech as well as the Moderna, there have been some anaphylactoid reactions, but even they have been very infrequent if you take the overall uh, incidence is concerned, uh, less than uh, one in 1.5 million. So minor side effects like uh, sore arm, uh, feeling a bit of uh, muscle pains or a sense of uh, mild feverishness for a day, is not uncommon, but those are considered minor side effects. And even if you take other vaccines, they generally do happen. But major side effects have been very infrequent and it appears that these vaccines are safe. However, there may have to be some precautions taken uh, in people who are otherwise prone to allergic disorders, particularly if there are preservatives in the vaccine, which are likely mm. to cause allergy. But otherwise in general, uh, these vaccines have proven their safety in the various uh, trials in each of the phases. Doctor, you mentioned uh, we have to rely on the information that the, the, um, the scientists who have come up with this vaccine have given to the regulator. 
a lot of the data has not been peer reviewed which is basically when a discovery is to do with healthcare is written in medical journals and is looked at by other members of the community how important a step is that and does it cause you is is it is if we're skipping that step because it's an emergency is that something to worry about well uh, i believe as far as the data are concerned the final judgment will be of the regulator but ideally it should be published also in scientific journals so that the rest of the scientific community has a full opportunity to look at it usually yes. the safety issues are sorted out by then it is the efficacy issues that are looked at much more critically but even the safety issues will have to be pursued not only during the three phases of the trials but also after the licensing even yes. when people start giving out the vaccine then there can be some relatively rare side effects which may be appearing and only when we have large number of people being injected then some of these things may make their appearance just like in the case of the pfizer vaccine uh, pfizer biontech in the uk uh, the uh, very first day they gave the injections to healthcare workers uh, they had two anaphylactoid reactions and then now we have seen them not only in uk but in usa and elsewhere too again not very common but they do happen in people who have that propensity for allergic reactions so it is very important that the um, side effects are also monitored after the vaccine is being rolled out because some of these groups of people would may not have been uh, actually involved in the main trial itself they may not have been enrolled in the main trial so it's only when you start gathering data in large numbers that you actually get the full picture of the side effects later on so it is important to monitor the safety but mm. as you said it is also important to have the data well publicized in the public view for others in the scientific community to peer review and also for the general public also to have a clarity on what's happening so a couple of questions that are actually coming up right now to do with the roll out of the vaccine in um, in india uh, while again there, there are two aspects to clinical trials one is the safety of whether they will be reactions which you addressed right now the other question is the efficacy how long what does it protect us from how long will it protect us um, for you know to be fair we've only had a year with the virus altogether so it's impossible to test longer than a year but given the fact that we are again skipping some steps here what information do you think we might be missing going into well, this world as far as the duration of protection is concerned it depends upon the strength of the immune response and on that we have two sources of information one is of the natural infection and second is that conferred by the vaccine itself as far as the natural infection is concerned mm. initially there was some degree of concern that the antibody levels were fading away in most people by 3 months now it appears that in some people with a fairly strong uh, virus challenge and possibly initially severe infection they are lasting longer than that even up to 6 months but much more importantly two other factors play a role one is cellular immunity whether there is also the additional component apart from antibodies of cellular immunity and that generally has been considered to last anywhere between 6 to 8 months in the people who have had the natural infection because that is the period of observation because this is a relatively new epidemic and has lasted only a few months uh, for that observation period but the other important element is that even if that immunity appears to be fading there is also a stored memory in terms of memory t cells which can get activated whenever challenged again by the virus and as long as they are there it appears that the immunity will again be in good shape but uh, we have now recently been seeing uh, that at least up to 8 months there seems to be reasonably good evidence of uh, immunity lasting and uh, as far as the vaccine itself is concerned because the vaccine gives you a standardized dose of the antigenic challenge as opposed to the very variable antigenic challenge in the natural infection in which the viral load could be low or viral load could be very high 
in the vaccine is a standardized challenge and it's a two dose challenge in most of these vaccines. And it is expected that the immune response would last at least for two years, that is the expectation. Recently, it's been said that the claim is that minimum one year, possibly up to two years, that appears to be the level of protection, but we still do not know it could even last longer. But this is what the claim is. Each vaccine has also declared an efficacy percentage. Some have said 90%, 92%, 70%, 50%. What does that mean? Well, basically, when you're giving the vaccine to a group of people and comparing them with almost an equal number of similar people to whom the vaccine has not been given, what's called the placebo group, then you try and find out in how many people in the uh, so-called placebo group who have not been given the vaccine, this particular disease has manifested and also count the numbers in the group where the vaccine has been given. So let us say that in the vaccinated group, you have five infections out of 100 people. Whereas in the others, if you have 50 infections out of 100 people, then you say, okay, compared to 50, this is only five. So you calculate the percentage and say, okay, this is protective to such an extent. Mm -hmm. So you have to compare the number of people who have developed infection in each of the groups and then uh, draw up a percentage figure. The, uh, the most common question that's popping up right now is will citizens, in your opinion, do you think citizens will be given the option to opt out of the vaccine if they want to? And if they choose to get the vaccine, do you think they'll be given a choice between the two options that we have on the table in India right now? Well, I think as far as the opting out of any vaccine is concerned, I think that is entirely a person's choice. I don't think it can be imposed upon. Ideally, with good vaccine literacy and persuasion, people should be willing to take it up. But if somebody has an objection for whatever reason, I don't think it can or should be thrust upon them. It's their right to refuse. They may change their mind later on, but that's fine. But whenever they refuse, I think that has to be taken as their final, uh, I mean, at least at that point in time, their right to exercise. Now, uh, between the two vaccines, it depends upon the availability and it depends upon uh, who is actually administering in which locality. Suppose a particular city has been only supplied one of the two vaccines, mm. then uh, obviously there is not much choice there. The other vaccine might have gone to another city. It is possible that you could say, no, I don't want this, I'd rather wait for the other one. But then we do not know when the other one will come in to the public distribution system. You may have to find alternate channels to obtain it. So it is best to take the vaccine that is available. But if there's a particular reason for a preference, and there is sometimes a preference that people would like to exercise, then yes. they can decline in the first instance. But there is no assurance that it's going to be available in the public system to them uh, soon enough. Do you think that there's, and there's been some conversation about whether or not the Serum Institute, for example, will be allowed to retail this vaccine in the open market, along with giving the order that the government, um, you know, um, will place. Should there be, and as a public health advocate, do you, do you believe that there should be two routes of availability, the free route through the public hospital or the paid for route through the private hospital? Is that a wise way to do it? Or will that lead to hoarding or cornering of the resource? I believe it's not correct at all to have these two routes, at least not till very late in the stage of a vaccine administration. Because first of all, we must recognize that this is what economists call a public good. Whenever there is an epidemic and there is a danger of one infected person spreading to many other people, then preventing that potential harm to others through immunization is absolutely an important public health function, which falls squarely within the responsibility of the government. Mm -hmm. So the government should be able to undertake that function and even prioritization of who should get it. For example, essential workers or people who are vulnerable because of age or because of associated health conditions determined by the government and deviating from that 
and letting people jump the queue merely because they can afford to pay for it is a very improper exercise. So okay. at least till the prioritized categories are completed, I don't think that particular channel should be opened up. Even later on, I think everybody who gets into a public facility or has access to the public health system should mm. be given free of cost and having an open market mechanism should not be uh, permitted to undermine that particular public health function. Uh, we had, and I, I said this in the beginning, the Serum Institute of India this morning in the Times of India made a statement saying the government has not placed the order yet. They haven't received the order. It's just verbal communication so far. Um, is there a reason, you think, for delay? Um, or is this normal? I mean, obviously, there's no such thing as normal right now. We live in extraordinary times. But is, is this worry? I think they're still uh, negotiating the price. Mm -hmm. And I think the government has a right to ask for a fair price. So I think th that negotiation is going on. But I think the vaccine will roll out soon, along with the other vaccine. But certainly, this vaccine will roll out. Doc, there's also a couple of questions that came in about senior citizens, people saying that, and you said yourself that, you know, seniors and people with comorbidities are more vulnerable to the virus and hence uh, are a priority, uh, you know, group. But do they have anything to worry about as far as the vaccine is concerned uh, in terms of any sort of side effects or any sort of, if, if we look at, for example, phase one and two, and some part of phase three information, has it been tested on pregnant women, on people with other um, conditions, people who are taking medication for other conditions, things like that? Well, uh, as far as uh, pregnant women are concerned, they've not been included. In fact, that's been a major issue because uh, many people have been saying that they should have been included. Mm. And uh, the question about uh, administering the vaccine to them, nevertheless, even if they were not included, and then uh, not uh, sort of discriminating against them, which might put them in jeopardy. That discussion is going on all over the world. Uh, but as far as elderly people are concerned, I think because in some of the trials, people above the age of 65 have been included. And whenever you take people above the age of 50, or in our case in India, about the age of 40, the likelihood of having associated medical conditions, known or unknown, is fairly high. I mean, That's you may have hypertension but not know it, but still, if you're above 60, the likelihood of being hypertensive is fairly high. And safety has been monitored in all those trials, which included even the upper end of the age bracket. So I think having the elderly people immunized should not be a problem. Uh, even if some of the earlier phases of the trials did not include them. Do you, uh, do you believe also, and you said in the beginning that there's been some observed uh, information or data that somebody who got the virus, who tested positive for COVID, has antibodies in their system for six or eight months. Another question that we're being asked uh, is, if I have had COVID and recovered, do I need to be vaccinated? And a lot of people might have had it and not known that they had it because they didn't get tested at the time. Do you believe there should be antibody testing because we have that test right now before the government decides who needs the vaccine and who doesn't? And the answer is no, and for these reasons. Firstly, we are never sure how strong the immune response was in response to the natural infection in any individual. That is entirely contingent upon two things. One is the viral load, how severe was the virus infection? And secondly, what was the capacity of the individual in terms of producing a strong immune response, whether the person was weak and emaciated and could not produce a good response or elderly and could not produce a good response. So those are some of the questions that come up. But generally, because the viral load is very variable, we can never be certain that there was a strong and durable immune response. On the other hand, with vaccination, because there is a standardized dose being given, and also now because there are two injections being given in most cases, that are the second one as a booster dose, the likelihood of having a strong immune response is there, which is also likely to be more durable. Mm -hmm. So if somebody had, uh, for example, the COVID-19 infection in March or April this year, 
there is no assurance now. I mean, March or April last year, uh, there's no assurance that, that at this point in time, uh, they're still going to be retaining very strong immunity. So they should go ahead and get uh, vaccinated. Should children be vaccinated? I, I know that there are a lower priority group in comparison to everybody else, but a lot of parents are wondering if at some point children will need to get vaccinated before they go back to school, and if that's something that has been tested and recommended. Well, people had not really gone below the age of 18 years earlier, and there was even some dispute in UK and USA whether the evidence available in the trials can be extended up to 16 years because the recommendations then were, let's go ahead and immunize even 16 to 17 year olds. But uh, now some others have now started extending the trial to the age of 12 years. The assumption being that below the age of 12 years, anyway, the likelihood of severe infection is very less likely and therefore might not uh, really have to uh, immunize the children. Okay. This again brings to the question, the purpose of the vaccine is to prevent disease, not so much the infection per se. So if children are not likely to get the disease, because most of them are unlikely to be severely affected, uh, even if they're infected, it should not worry too much. So that is the general assumption. But it is also possible that we may be getting other vaccines which can be inhaled rather than through intramuscular injections which are far easier to take for children. And there are mucosal vaccines, there are also sterilizing vaccines, mm -hmm. which prevent also the infection per se, not just the disease. So once they come in, which may be the <coughs> second wave of vaccines, uh, then children may be immunized. But by that time, the priority remains of uh, older uh, people. There was a story, in fact, broken today by India Today, talking about a nasal vaccine that Bharat Biotech is working on. Is that a possibility, you think, maybe in the yeah. next round? Well, there are some others also working on nasal vaccines, uh, and uh, even internationally. But uh, Bharat Biotech also has said that it's working on a nasal vaccine. So a nasally administered vaccine he is likely to be helpful as I said, because it's also a sterilizing vaccine. Uh, being a mucosal vaccine, it can prevent from the virus from settling in, uh, even for a short while in the nose or the throat with the respiratory tract. Whereas the vaccines which are given by injection are only likely to prevent the virus that has already entered the body from resulting in disease by fighting, off, fighting it off. So the nasal vaccine will theoretically offer great advantage, but again, the proof will be in the clinical trials. Unless yes. the trial shows the evidence, we can't really bet on it. Well, that's the question about the clinical trials. And there was a question that came up when the government um, you know, handed out approvals to these two vaccines that now India has access to, uh, the one from Bharat Biotech and the one from AstraZeneca. A lot of people couldn't understand what the regulator meant when they said that, you know, with precaution, uh, if necessary, we will then use this as a backup. ICMR came out and gave a clarification saying we will use the Bharat Biotech uh, vaccine, which has only done phase one and two and not completed its phase three, as a backup in case of very high infections. Um, what is your interpretation of, uh, of what they meant by that? Well, if, if the Serum Institute or the Oxford vaccine has been approved and is safe to use, why do we need a backup? Well, uh, there are several reasons why. Firstly, the Serum Institute's vaccine may not be available in abundant supply mm. to meet the needs of the entire country. The second is there was some concern that the vaccines that have been developed may or may not be very effective against some of the mutants now that have entered, whether the British mutant or the South African mutant. So the question was, any vaccine that is directed specifically against the spike protein, because most of the vaccines that have been developed so far have been against the spike protein, which is what the virus uses as a handle or a key to enter the cell. Now, if the mutations are actually taking place mostly in the spike protein. Will the 
immunity produced against the spike protein as a result of the vaccine be effective against the mutant? That question was being raised. Initially, it was said from Britain and elsewhere that the mutations there, while substantial in number, did not appear to be giving the virus the power to evade the immune response. They could still be susceptible. But since some concerns were raised and including now in South Africa, it is said though the mutations are less in number of that particular virus, but the distortions are of such a nature that it might not be responsive to the immunity conferred by the vaccine. It's not clear yet, but since concerns were raised, the Bharat Biotech vaccine is an inactivated virus. And being an inactivated virus, it offers more proteins as antigens for drawing the immune response. It offers at least three different proteins, again, not just the spike protein, but two other proteins as well. So the theoretical consideration is that suppose there is a mutant that manages to evade the immunity against the spike protein, at least there is some additional protection conferred by the extended band of immunity that an inactivated virus pro provides. Secondly, there is one other reason. Yes. That even, even a, vi a virus which is considered to be an adenovirus, which is relatively innocuous, which carries the code for the spike protein, that virus under normal circumstances may be quite innocuous. But in an immunocompromised person or an immunosuppressed person, even that virus can be problematic. So you may not be able to give that vaccine. On the other hand, a completely inactivated vaccine is safe even to be given to such people. Mm -hmm. So in order to keep that kind of additional leeway available, I think that was the argument that was made Though I agree, it could have been explained far better and far more clearly. Well, we've, we're, uh, and I know that you've addressed this once, but we're still getting a lot of questions from viewers who are joining us, particularly uh, scared about their parents. KG says, um, you know, for a person with a rare, rare TB infection, is it safe to take the vaccine? Tedia says that my parents, um, you know, are not doing too well physically. Ranu, my parents are not doing too well physically. I'm concerned about whether or not they should get the vaccine. Um, again, I've had a severe lung infection and a rare type of TB last year. I don't go out because I'm afraid of COVID. Should I get the vaccine? So a lot of people are still worried about their particular conditions or their particular ailments and whether the vaccine poses any sort of risk to them. Well, the standard answer is that you must consult your physician. But nevertheless... I think it is important for them to recognize that if they already have a health issue, particularly like tuberculosis of the lung, which has already damaged a bit of the lung, then having this particular virus also cause damage further on to your lung through viral pneumonitis is going to be even more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if your parents are relatively weak, then they're much more vulnerable to the severity of the infection so it is best to protect them. I mean, just like elderly people are generally advised everywhere to take flu shots because they're much more vulnerable. So I think it is important that we must protect people who are otherwise likely to be severely affected by the virus. Younger people possibly could do with uh, getting their shots later, but people who are elderly and not in good health are the people who are most likely to be protected. But yes. of course, each individual must be assessed also uh, prior to that. Doc, uh, there's, been, there's been a lot of criticism in how the communication has been handled around these vaccines. So for example, the government handing out emergency use approvals when no such thing exists within our framework of regulation. Even those, and, and I know as a journalist, I know a lot of uh, pharma journalists and those who cover healthcare for many, many years who were completely aghast with how the government handled this issue. Would you explain to us, just for our understanding, uh, does emergency use approval make sense at this point, even if it doesn't exist in our framework? Is it, does it make sense to sort of just come up with it because we live in extraordinary times? 
or did the government mishandle communication on this uh, you know on this particular note well uh, not being a spokesperson for the government i'll try and attempt better communication <laughs> well uh, from my point of view i think there was a sense of urgency mm. that uh, the pandemic is continuing to spread across the world many countries are now experiencing a very severe second wave or third wave we have somehow managed to get a good control of the pandemic in terms of declining deaths and case counts but if we suddenly have a further upsurge and even with the mutants knocking on the door there could be major problems so we must start vaccinating and certainly as far as astrazeneca is concerned that particular vaccine had fulfilled the criteria bharat biotech had fulfilled the safety criteria by not only phase 1 and phase 2 but also the 25000 cases that were there in phase 3 uh, no adverse events were really reported so that was adequate for safety the question about bharat biotech was did it meet the efficacy test Yes. and the efficacy test was in terms of immunogenicity yes in phase 1 and phase 2 it had met but in terms of the actual clinical trial it is still to be completed but it was thought that it might be helpful to have that also ready for use as soon as the clinical trial is completed or even before that for any requirement of uh, additional vaccine stocks so i think uh, to that extent if they had given some sort of a conditional approval but with very strict conditions being laid down and clearly communicated to the public as well it would have helped you know here's the thing um overseas there has been this entire sort of uh, campaign of anti vaxxers they're called anti vaxxers people who doubt the efficacy of vaccines in general people there's been a separate group of people who doubted the science and the data saying that there is some gray area of a connection between vaccine and um you know some uh, problems that children have developed because their parents have taken vaccines and things like that and science is not fully clear that out india has never had an issue of anti vaxxers we've had an issue of public health distribution where we a lot of people in our population didn't have access to vaccines but we never rejected vaccines as a population we now find ourselves in a position where people are questioning whether this has been messed up should we take it should we not take it there's an element of mistrust do you believe this is because of lack of information lack of data or just poor, poor communication i think communication could have been certainly much better i mean there may not be an open anti vaccine campaign or hostility hmm. but certainly there is a certain degree of uncertainty and anxiety which i think should be addressed it cannot be addressed only through mass media channels however helpful they are it is very important to engage community groups and to use local community networks and local influencers to have people share their concerns and anxieties and address them so that ultimately the confidence level builds up <clears throat> and we had this in three levels right from the beginning first there was fear and stigma which we saw and that could have been handled if there were good community networks second we had hesitation for testing that again could have been handled if there were good community networks now we'll see the third level which is for the actual vaccines again having apart from mass media it's very important to have whether it's the ngos or community based organizations or women self help groups and others to play that level of uh, the role of uh, local community influencers and i think that is where uh, some of these anxieties can be addressed i think lack of information adequately and frequently conveyed results in these kind of doubts creeping in we have another question and, and i obviously this is the biggest concern nivedita says i'm a healthcare worker should i be worried about taking a vaccine that has not completed phase 3 trial because healthcare workers have now realized they are the phase 3 trial um in india the three healthcare the three crore healthcare workers who will receive the first sort of uh, roll out that will come in it's their data that will also be collated to form the phase 3 trial 
is it fair right now to them i mean they are going to feel a little bit like guinea pigs well what uh, bharat biotech announced and we'll have to still get clarity on that is that they're going to continue in two tracks one is the incomplete trial which had mm-hmm. not yet reached the 26000 mark which is about it was about uh, a little short of that having reached about 25000 or so or 24500 they said they were going to complete the recruitment and they were going to complete that track as planned in addition to that there'll be an open roll out in which people would be given the vaccine that's the government policy and then monitored for both efficacy and for safety purposes so if that is so we should expect even the phase 3 trial as originally planned to be completed soon though in we will get the data only by march because if some of the people who are at the end who are now being immunized for the first dose then they will require one more dose after 28 days and then wait for another 6 weeks to see the full response so we will not see the trial results till march but at least the trial would be completed but in terms of the other open uh, label use uh, then of course they will also have to be monitored very carefully if there are people who are being offered that vaccine and have doubts about this or concerns about this they can express it and ask for the other vaccine whether that's going to be immediately available or not we'll have to see uh, but by march we should have far greater clarity from both sides so actually doc so here's the thing do we know and we know that state governments are sort of preparing themselves central government is preparing itself we don't know yet if the orders would be placed by the central government and then distributed to the states or will it be placed by individual state governments in which case we don't know if one particular hospital or district will have two different vaccines with that option or will an entire state be given or entire district be given only one option at a time in order to be able to cover a larger um, sort of space in our country um it's very possible or very likely that the option might not exist of saying hey i don't want this one can i have the other one yes that's very likely it is possible that only one lot of vaccine may reach a particular district even for logistic purposes that's the easier way so if it is found out for example that some people don't want vaccine a but would rather wait for vaccine b then they'll have to register that and hope that later on it will come through but in some of the large metros where this is going to start there possibly both the vaccines may be available but mm-hmm. whether in a particular area of the city where one particular vaccine has been assigned the other vaccine also will come in or this person has to go somewhere else in the city to get that vaccine we we'll have to wait and see what the logistics would be uh, but i think it's much more likely that uh, different states and different districts would see specified lots of one vaccine rather than both the vaccines being available in every district well the last question that i do want to ask you um uh, on whether or not and obviously these vaccines yes sorry um the government will have to spend a uh, a large amount of money on these vaccines like you said they're probably still negotiating with the serum institute on what the cost of each bale of vaccine is going to be uh, upwards of 1 lakh crore rupees is the back of the envelope calculation of what this entire operation is going to cost in a year when tax collection has been low the government doesn't have as much disposable money at hand as they would have in any other year so as a public health advocate obviously we have realized that in the last one year our public health infrastructure is wholly inadequate uh it's a it's a punch to the gut really what you've been talking about for years the rest of the country sort of woke up to this year the government is going to have to prioritize where it's spending its money the vaccine is a non negotiable but do you recommend going into this union budget this month and the month after that there be a larger allocation to public health care than there has been in the past it is absolutely necessary there's no doubt about it unless you have a fairly strong well functioning public health system even in the steady state you are never going to be able to get a good surge response in if they when faced with a public health emergency but even just look at this 
if you are saying that people who are more likely to die of this particular infection are people with non communicable diseases like hypertension diabetes coronary heart disease etc how many people are there who are undetected it's all right to say that okay these are the people who we know have this problem and we'll prioritize them but there'll be very many people particularly in smaller towns and villages who may not know that they have diabetes or hypertension so we have to make sure that we have a functioning health system which is capable of taking care of many problems whether it's child immunization or antenatal checkups or diagnosis and treatment of hypertension and diabetes there are many functions that our health system has to perform which yes. unfortunately it's not capable of doing if it is not adequately resourced resourced both financially and in terms of adequate number of people in the health workforce so we do need to invest a lot more otherwise we'll continue to pay a price this time the world has got a big jolt because this particular epidemic has lasted quite long and it has had a severe effect on the economy otherwise an infectious disease outbreak lasting for 50 days or 20 days only causes a few ripples and then fades off i mean like children dying in gorakhpur for example that is a media story for a week or 10 days afterwards what happens so i think this particular virus being with us for a year or more is helpful in that sense that it has brought great attention to public health in a sustained manner but that ought to be reflected also in the budget in terms of investments yes. to strengthen our health system Well, last question from Kanish Singh is just popped in. He said, uh, "When can we expect the vaccines in private markets?" The doctors already answered this question a little earlier. Kanish, he basically said, "It's not advisable to have it in private markets at all until all of our, uh, you know, high-risk groups and our focus groups are already covered by the vaccine for free, because then you'll actually have a cornering of that resource uh, for people who have the money to buy it, which is not really in the spirit of public health." will the pfizer and the moderna uh, vaccines be available in india they haven't been approved in india right now have they doctor no they have not been i mean there have been media reports that pfizer has approached for approval that mm. they may even manufacture it in india but clearly they are only be looking at niche markets of larger cities where that kind of refrigeration facility of minus 70 degrees is going to be available though they may actually prepare transport facilities if or even carrying it further but they can never cover the whole country in any case with that kind of a cold chain requirement of minus 70 degrees moderna i don't think has even approached so we i think those two vaccines still need to be evaluated by our uh, regulator even if they do come in but at the moment these are the two vaccines but we also have uh, the russian vaccine which is uh, sputnik 5 v which is now being looked at uh, by being produced by the ready labs in hyderabad and also the uh, <clears throat> there is also one more uh, vaccine which is a virus particle vaccine uh, which is also being produced by biological e and uh, there is another vaccine that is zydus cadila which is looking at a dna vaccine so there are at least three or four other plat- platforms and mm-hmm. i think genova is going in for an mrna vaccine so in the next 6 months we will have several other indian vaccines coming forth in fact i think in the next 2 or 3 months we'll see about two of them uh, coming to the regulator so we will have several vaccines therefore we don't have to be dependent upon a pfizer or moderna all right uh, doctor thank you so much a quick recap for those people who are still popping in and asking the same question what dr reddy has told us so far is simply this that from the trials that have taken place we know that this vaccine is not going to cause you to grow scales there is not going to be like a surprisingly shocking you know uh, mutation or i think that you've seen in the films is going to happen to you you're not going to turn into spider man uh, we know the safety already exists the question of the length of protection which we simply hadn't had the time to check it could be 2 years it could be 1 year it could be a little more on that that we're only going to have to figure out with time as it goes forward so the question of safety and side effects you can look it up so far from what we know the side effects are mild they're rare they include an allergic reaction pain in your arm where you get the shot or maybe a feeling of being feverish or muscle ache 
Um, that's what we know so far. For the people in the focus groups, the people who are particularly uh, at risk for COVID, you have less to fear from the vaccine than you do from COVID. You're better off having gotten the vaccine. That's what the, uh, the doc has said to us so far. Doctor, thank you so much uh, for answering those questions. For our audience, we're going to divide these questions into chapters so you can take a look at each of them and uh, find out uh, you know, the answers to them. They're very clear and they're very helpful. And of course, we'll keep talking about this as it moves forward. It is um, a, a time, thankfully, when um, public health care professionals are the heroes of the day and really the people we should be listening to, led from the front by people like Professor Dr. Reddy. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you very much and wish you a very happy new year. You too, Doctor.